evening and welcome. Uh, I'm Agatha Crisperes and uh, I'm delighted to see you all and especially Professor Agapitos. Our eminent speaker this evening, Panagiotis Agapitos, is Professor of Byzantine Literature at the University of Cyprus. He studied Byzantine History and Literature, History of Byzantine Art and Musicology at the University of Munich and Classics and Byzantine Literature at Harvard University, where he gained his uh, PhD in uh, 1990. He has published uh, many books, uh, some of them are the Narrative Structure in the Byzantine Vernacular Romances in 1991, The Study of Medieval Greek Romance, uh, 92, uh, Theodoros Metohidis on Greek Philosophy and Ancient History in 1996. Uh, and the first edition, a critical uh, edition of the 13th century verse romance, Livistros and Rodamni. I hope I'm, I'm, re I'm pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> Again, a, a, a volume with translations into modern Greek of Byzantine descriptions of works of art. As well, as he produced also a small book on medieval erotic fiction around the Mediterranean, um, Mediterranean, and that was published in 2008. Some 70 articles in international journals and collective volumes cover subjects such, such as the history of manuscripts and the education in Byzantium, Byzantine rhetoric and poetics, the representation and literary function of death in Byzantine literature, as well as the image of Byzantium in modern Greek literature. He, his most recent publication in 2012 is an edited volume of medieval narratives between history and fiction, from the center to the periphery of Europe, so, uh, years 1100 to 1400. Professor Agapitos is currently preparing an English translation with introduction and notes on Livistros and uh, Rodamni, the uh, 19th century verse romance that I mentioned above, and this is preparing this for translated text for Byzantinists. And also he's preparing a booklet study on the historiography of Byzantine philology and the periodization of Byzantine literature. He has taught as visiting professor at the Freie Universität Berlin, the Ecole de Haute Etude uh, et Sciences uh, Sociales, I'm sorry, in Paris, and Stanford University. Parallel to his scholarly activities, he's a writer of historical crime fiction, which I'm really looking forward to read. <laughs> uh, in 2003, he published his Byzantine mystery novel, The Ebony Loot, set in 9th century Caesarea of Cappadocia, Cappadocia, uh, in, now in modern uh, day Turkey, and it was followed by the Copper and Enamel Medusa. Uh, in 2009. I don't know if the professor is writing another book now, so he will tell us. And uh, let's welcome Professor Agapitos. So it is a great pleasure to be here tonight. I am uh, delighted. I am honored by the invitation uh, for a particular reason that uh, working and living in Cyprus uh, for 23 years now it is a great pleasure to be invited by the Hellenic Center and its uh, very strong Cypriot present and presence and interests. And so I decided to talk to you about something Cypriot. Um, and let me just say before I start my talk that what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is part of a research uh, project that is coming out as a book pretty soon, probably in March next year, and it is a volume uh, dedicated to the Panagia uh, Tuaraca in Lagudera as a building and uh, a uh, historical monument belonging to the UNESCO heritage, um, and it will be the first volume fully dedicated to this church with a set of magnificent color photographs that are being sponsored by the Levendis Foundation uh, in Cyprus and under the direction of the archaeological uh, department of antiquities in, in, in Nicosia. So um, 
what I'm going to talk to you tonight is part of the chapter that I am contributing to this uh, volume, and it, it, it is about the way in which inscribed texts function in the frescoes of the Church uh, of the Virgin Mary uh, at La Gudera in Cyprus. You know, as a Byzantinist, I believe that these are demonic instruments, so, <clears throat> you know, you never know how these functions are. So the strong presence of the written word in the visual arts of many older civilizations can hardly go unnoticed. The European Middle Ages are no exception. The number of inscriptions incorporated into paintings of all types, for example, frescoes, manuscripts, mosaics, portable icons, is simply endless. The visual presence of such inscriptions is in many cases remarkably dominant. Art historians, philologists, and historians have systematically studied the content of these inscribed texts, the calligraphy of the letters used, but also the purely visual form and typology of these inscriptions. The study of all of these issues contributes to the dating of a work of art, to the understanding of the depictions included in it, and even to the interpretation, if we can say so, of the meaning of a specific word of art in its historical context. However, however, it is not this kind of issues that will concern us in my talk this evening, since I shall focus on the inscriptions incorporated in the frescoes of a small church outside La Gudera, a village in the rural area of Pizzilla, situated on the northeastern slopes of the Trodos mountain in Cyprus, right in the very center of the island. The church, as we find it today, dedicated to the Panagia Arachiotisa, or Virgin Mary of the Wild Vetch, as it is officially called, but uh, it's uh, basically Arakas, uh, a form of, of larger P, uh, was built around 1175 to 1180, i.e. during the time of the Byzantine uh, rule of the island, but was renovated and fully decorated at the expense of Lord Leo Tuafendu in the year 1192, namely the very year in which <coughs> um, Richard uh, the Lionheart, King of uh, England and Duke of Aquitaine, conquered the island and took it away from the Byzantine uh, sphere of power. My aim here is to approach this specific building as what I would call an active space by examining the presence, character, and function of the various inscriptions which are included in its painterly decoration. I am interested in the aesthetic impression that these inscriptions evoke as painted discourse, asking what is the purpose of this aesthetic impression in relation to the users of the building during the first years of its renovated function, that is, at the end of the 12th and the very beginning of the 13th century. Now, the building, as we have it today, has undergone two further stages of rebuilding. The original structure is what is marked in green. It is a building slightly less than 15 meters in length, and that is the original church. It was part of a small um, monastery that was surrounding it on its northern part. Then the building was uh, redeveloped and expanded in the 14th century with a new developed set of entrances and a further part of the church. And that is where you enter the church today. This is its official entrance. And then finally, in the 18th century, which you saw in the picture, it got a fully covered wooden roof in the style of churches from the Balkans. There is an influence there from um, Serbian, Bulgarian, and Russian architecture. And they were built in order to protect uh, primarily the churches of the Trodos mountain from the strong snowfall 
uh, in the mountain because the, um, 16th, the 17th and the 18th century were two centuries very cold in Cyprus with a lot of snow. So a lot of churches during that time got these uh, covers with wood, making the churches look very different than they did in their original uh, phase. I now will concentrate exclusively, sorry, I, I will concentrate exclusively on the interior of the original building of 1192. So let me first of all give you a very brief impression of this interior. How does the church look? Here is the view of the church when we stand at its original west wall and look towards the sanctuary in the east. So it is this that we are looking at here. And you can already see that all of the church is completely covered with frescoes. When moving into the center of the church and looking upwards, we gaze at the dome with its drum balancing on the four pendentives. So here is the dome with its drum and here are the four pendentives. When we lower our gaze to the left, we see the north wall and its door. So the dome is up here. Here are two pendentives, an inner arcade and then the main wall. And if then we look uh, finally to the right, we see the south wall with the equivalent. Here, in fact, you can also see a little bit the uh, windows on the drum, the pendentives, the other arch and the walls below with the original flooring underneath. As you can see, the church is fully covered from top to bottom with paintings of the highest craftsmanship and artistic finesse by one uh, artist and his probably his team. And it is for good reasons that this small church is one of the most important ecclesiastical buildings of the Comnenian era, of the whole 12th century, for the whole of the Byzantine Empire. Because the artist was a Constantinopolitan artist who had been invited to come to Cyprus and paint for Lord Leo, and not only for Lord Leo, he has painted also other churches, the same person. He lived about 10 to 12 years in Cyprus working, but we don't know his name. Before examining the inscriptions of this Byzantine church, it will be useful to bring to mind what are the functions of the inscribed word within an image, because these functions in contemporary art are quite different from those in Byzantium. In a modern work of art, <clears throat> words are incorporated as an inseparable part of the visual whole. In other words, should the words be removed from the image, the work is completely destroyed. And let me give you two examples. For example, in the very famous painting of Jacques-Louis David, Marat murdered of 1793, the dead man still holds in his hand the letter sent to him by his murderess, Charlotte Corday, and the letter is actually written on the painting, while the painter now himself has signed the painting as if his name was an engraving already existent on the wooden box serving as a provisional desk. If you remove these words, the painting is destroyed. They're totally inside the painting. Similarly, to just see a completely different image. In Juan Miró's surrealist painting, Snail, Woman, Flower, Star of 1934, the title in French, Escargot, Femme, Fleur, Etoile, constitutes a dynamic part of the work in its immediate connection with the depicted forms. Again, if you take the words out, the painting is completely destroyed. The above remarks are not valid in the same manner for the presence of the written word in Byzantine art. Though a written discourse certainly is part of an image, it is not incorporated in this image on the basis of painterly criteria, but rather of 
rhetorical criteria. That is to say, the word performs a function of verbal display. It is the word that is displayed. And here I've taken uh, the uh, west wall of the central part of the church of the Panagia Forviotisa in Asinu, also uh, on the Troodos mountain, but uh, painted about 80 years before um, the church of uh, Atla Gudera, where you can see the inscriptions. They, they, the inscriptions either relate to pieces of information, ikimisis, the name of Christ, Jesus Christos. Uh, here um, uh, is another inscription uh, indicating uh, a scene. It's Christ at the, in the temple. Or, of course, the, uh, the inscription makes a statement. In this case, for example, it is a poem that is painted under the inscription, under the painting, describing the actual painting itself. This rhetorical dimension of the word as image in Byzantine art is strongly connected with its acoustical dimension, and this is something that we tend as, as historians and, and archaeologists to forget. Um, because the inscribed discourse is literally speaking through the work of art. Especially in the case of inscriptions within the painterly decorations of a church, sound is very significant because the congregation perceives this sound as performed during mass or other services. The experience then of the word as active sound is very important for a society with a very high percentage of illiteracy. People did not necessarily uh, read the inscriptions, but they heard what the inscriptions said because they were reflected in the mass, in the hymns, and other parts of the services. Now, the words of the inscriptions, therefore, are not only letters to be read, but sounds to be heard. The visual and acoustic nature of the word within the image obviously does not imply orality of discourse. That is, like, for example, with folk songs. This is, these are not texts that were perceived as oral. The word is written because it is true and valid. In other words, it is always the same. Like, for example, here from La Gudera, the grand uh, nativity scene where uh, three captions explain, first of all, who the characters are, imagi, the um, scene itself, i Christu Genesis, and then the angel's words to the shepherds. I, I will come to this te uh, text a little bit shorter. Um, this, the fact that the words are always the same, is a basic characteristic of cultures of the book. And one of the main differences between the ancient Greek and the medieval Greek world. While ancient religion, with its various ritual practices, was not defined by a recorded truth, but rather by many oral traditions, Christian religion and its own ritual practices are defined by books that codify the truth, such as the Gospels or the text of the Divine Liturgy. Therefore, this written discourse contributes to the truth of the image and to the complex functions of visual and verbal display for a medieval society. Written discourse appears in the painted decoration of the Arachiotisa in two forms. Firstly, it takes the shape of a physical object, whether it is a bound book or a loose scroll. Secondly, it takes the shape of a suspended inscription that is suspended literally above the scene itself. These two forms of written discourse express within the paintings what I would call five specific functions, and these are very important functions for understanding how the active space of a church operates. 
The first function is explanatory, where the inscription explains what the faithful see depicted in the active space in which they have entered. So, the dormition of the All Holy Mother of God, Ikimisis tis Iperagias Theotoku. The preparation, Ietimasia, meaning the preparation of the throne of God at the last judgment. Jesus Christ, the Holy Mandilion, Jesus Christos to Agion Mandilion, this is the famous Edessa image of Christ. Um, and a very particular Byzantine version, Jesus Christ, the Holy Tile, Jesus Christos to Agion Keramidin. Now, these are all, of course, from the Panagia Tuaraka. This, this final, this, this particular now depiction of the image of Christ on a tile um, includes the dated dedicatory inscription, which is also explanatory, and that is here. This dedicatory uh, inscription is explanatory because the donor points to his own contribution to the church, which is the painterly decor decoration. And this is the first text on your handout, if you would like to take a look. Uh, you have the text both in Greek and in an English translation. Um, I will read you the Greek. Anistoristi ο πάνσεπτος ναός της υπεραγίας Θεοτόκου του Άρακος δια συνδρομής και πολλού πόθου κυρού Λέοντος του Αυθέντου μηνύ Δεκεμβρίο ενδικτιώνος εν δεκάτης το εξάκης χιλιοστό επτακοσιοστό πρώτο έτους. Note, please, that the word, the first word, ανιστορίσθη means in Byzantine Greek painted or to be more literal covered with visual stories. The Byzantines used the word historia to mean a painting. The second function of the word is narrative. Since the suspended inscriptions convey the true words of specific characters within these visual stories represented in a particular scene. A fine example are the words of the angel addressing the startled shepherds in the Nativity. It's a famous passage from the second chapter of Luke, and I read it in the King's Bible translation, and of course you will recognize it immediately. It appears in Handel's Messiah. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. The third function is prophetic. When the painted word conveys the sayings of the prophets who spoke in the Old Testament about the coming of Christ. Thus, the prophet Isaiah, up in the dome of the uh, church, holds in his left hand an open roll, while he points with his right hand to Christ, who is exactly above him in the dome. On the roll, we see inscribed the famous verse proclaiming the birth of the Messiah uh, from chapter 7 of Isaiah's poetry, and this is also a passage that you know, it also comes in Handel's Messiah. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The fourth function is admonitory. The inscription admonishes the faithful in an emphatic manner, usually by addressing them directly. Saint Andronicus, for example, advises, and that's a passage from uh, Maximus Confessor, an author, theologian of the 7th century, he, he tells, brethren, he who is afraid of the Lord is afraid of hell. 
and he who is afraid of hell practices self-restraint. The Apostle Peter, for example, holds a role saying, and that is a passage from his own epistle, the epistle of Peter, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. In this way, the saints speak in their own words which the faithful know from their respective readings during the ecclesiastical year. The fifth and last and extremely important function of the inscriptions is intercessory. That is, when the person speaking and consequently the inscription he or she is holding addresses a specific recipient with a specific uh, request on behalf of a third person. Such an intercessory function is performed, for example, by the Virgin Mary as the mercy-giving Mother of God, Mitir Theu Ieleusa, um, which she is holding when addressing Christ. And this is an inscription that we will look at more carefully towards the end of the talk. These five functions, and an inscription might perform two or even three functions uh, simultaneously within a building, are subject to a very central principle of Christian art, of religious art in general, and that is instruction. As image and sound in a church, the written word teaches us in various ways about life in Christ. Especially so, does the written word guide the ascetic exertions of the monks in their arduous path towards God. But how is the presence of this written word that we have now seen organized within the active space of the church? To begin with, the interior of the church and that the uh, Panagia Tuaraca uh, in, in La Gudera is a typical, um, what we call, um, church with a cross shape and the dome on top. The interior of the church consists of three major structural levels, architecturally speaking. The dome with the drum, the pandantifs, the arches and the apse of the sanctuary, and finally the vertical lines of the, the walls below the pandantifs. Each of these structural levels conveys a different sense of space. Vaulted on the top and therefore polydimensional in level A, curved and thus three-dimensional in level B, and vertical and therefore two-dimensional in level C. If we observe now the arrangement of the frescoes in the three structural levels, we will realize that the painterly decoration of the church is also divided into three levels, which I shall term hierarchic. They have a hierarchic structure. D, the heavenly world of the Old Testament. E, the world of Christ's incarnation and of the New Testament. And finally, F, the earthly world of saints. It is striking that the structural and hierarchic levels coincide with each other completely, since D is found only in A, E only in B, and F only in C. Within these two overlapping sets of three levels, the inscriptions find an appropriate structured place. Thus, the rolls and books appear in levels AD and CF, while the suspended inscriptions are found only in levels B and E. The function of the inscriptions are similarly structured. 
The explanatory function appears in all three levels, since all the holy persons and the major scenes are accompanied by inscriptions which identify them. However, in level AD, we find only the prophetic function. In BE, again, we find only the narrative function. While in level CF, here, we find only the admonitory and the intercessory functions. As modern viewers, think of it for a moment, as modern viewers, we perceive the presence of written discourse when we step into such a, ch a church as marked, because they are all over, but as coincidental. The reason is, of course, because we are interested in the paintings as art. So we look at the paintings rather than at the paintings with the inscriptions. In fact, the written discourse is one single entity of texts and functions organized with great care in order to be consonant with the structural and hierarchic arrangement of the church, enhancing in this manner the perception of the building as an active space in which we stand in and in which we partake of the divine liturgy. The person, therefore, who stands in the church of the Arachiotisa and looks eastwards towards the sanctuary, and you can see it even in this photograph very well, has the feeling that the space is broadened from above downwards as his gaze moves from the narrower and farthest up level of the dome towards the wider and nearest level in order to reach the floor. Thus, the inscriptions move downwards. Sorry, let's see that again. Uh, thus, the inscriptions move downwards as they descend from the eternal time of God to the past of Christ's presence on earth and finally to the present of the saints and of the faithful themselves. However, in the central space of the church, that is below the dome and at the level of the saint, the faithful come upon two compositions where the voice of the inscriptions ascends towards Christ. <clears throat> and these two compositions, which we'll look now in the last section of my talk, are particularly important for Leo as donor of the church, but also for the faithful. They also are of paramount importance for, understanding, for the understanding of the church's visual decoration as an essential component of its active space, since the interior of the church accurately reflects the heavenly order, the state of spiritual understanding, and the mental activity, what the Byzantines called energia, which is directed towards God. It is the theory of energia of Dionysius the Areopagite and his famous treatise on the um, celestial hierarchy. And in fact, uh, I was seeing the other day at the uh, National Gallery, there is a very nice internal exhibition of Botticini's uh, Ascension of the Virgin Mary, where you have on this Florentine panel exactly the heavenly hierarchy. It's a completely different understanding of Dionysius the Areopagite, but it's very much the same aesthetic and, and theological principle that we have there. So. Let us then for a moment imagine that we are entering the church along with the monks just before the beginning of the divine liturgy on a Sunday morning around the year 1200. Since the cells of the monks were at the north side of the church, the monks would use the north entrance of the building. Reaching the threshold of the open entrance, the monks passed through two paintings depicting the cross of Christ's martyrdom. I have marked the entrance right here with blue arrow. Right? <coughs> like guardians, the two crosses protect the monks during their entrance. And this protective role 
is underlined by the one verse inscriptions placed under the horizontal beams of each uh, cross. And if you actually walk, the, the inscriptions are exactly on a normal average person's eye level. So that you walk and you actually go right next to the inscriptions. You don't necessarily see the cross, but the inscriptions, you see them. Once the monks would have passed the threshold of the north entrance and stepped on the cobbled floor, they would see directly opposite them and at gaze level the first of the two compositions which I referred to already. This composition consists of two large paintings covering the wall on the lower part of the South Bay. On the right stands Archangel Michael, dressed in full formal imperial attire, while on the left stands the Mother of God in front of a luxurious, luxurious throne holding the infant Christ in her arms. The size of the painting, take a look at it, the, the, remember here is the floor, and so height level is approximately about here, I mean our heads are somewhere here. Um, the size of the painting depicting the Virgin is imposing and the quality of the depiction quite impressive. Yet, at the level of the eyes of the monks and of the other faithful who are in the church, an inscription has been suspended. You, you can see the letters here and here. The inscription, the longest text found in the church is an epigram, a poem, that is in 13 accentuated 12 syllable verses and this is the text number C on your handouts. Let's look at it more carefully. It frames the Virgin from left to right while another inscription, and that is the very famous inscription that gives to the church its official Byzantine name, characterizes the depicted holy person in its local manifestation, that is, Mitirtheu is on the top, Iarachiotisa ke kecharitomeni. The poem, now, is a supplication by Leo towards the Mother of God, requesting of her to protect him and his family while they are alive, but also to provide for them the salvation of their souls when they die. Leo's voice ascends as an entreaty to heaven and to the Virgin. However, even though the poem is personal, the phrasing of the last three verses of the poem, if you look at them, are so generic, is so generic that it allows the reader to consider the words of the poem as their own prayer to Mary. The inscription's visual arrangement supports this feeling, where the donor's voice is identified with the voices of the faithful, since the second and more general part of the poem the supplication itself, that is, stands on its own to the right-hand side of the Arachiotisa. This is not a coincidence. The poem itself belongs, as we philologists tend to say, to the category of dedicatory epigrams that accompany a two-dimensional painting or a three-dimensional object. Many poems such as this one survives from the Byzantine period and indeed, as in the case of the Arachiotisa, they have been preserved, painted or engraved on the objects themselves. In particular, the type of the Arachiotisa poem, that is, the dedicatory epigram to a Nikon, is particularly widespread. The specific poem was obviously composed by the artist in agreement with the donor based on textual material that painters usually recorded in their notebooks and carried along with them when they went on an assignment. The first two verses in this epigram where special emphasis is given to the icon, if, if you read the lines, Achrandon 
ο συν εκμορφώσας εικόνα χρώμαση φερτής πάναγνε θεομήτορ Um, these two lines are noteworthy since visually they are placed these are the first two lines <clears throat> they, they, are, they, um, they are placed just below the attribute Iarachiotisa their significance for the readers is crucial because the words point to a strange miracle The immaculate image, and the adjective achrandos here suggests the immaterial essence of the holy person's true image of the Panagia, has taken form, granted by the donor, because the donor is the person who is described as o ek morphosas, the one who shapes the painting, um, with the help of perishable materials, namely the colors, chromata. So the use of an actually fully painterly vocabulary, ikon, ekmorfono, chroma, transforms the dedicatory text into what is called a descriptive epigram. In other words, into a poem which implicitly describes the object which it accompanies. Thus, the humble phrasing of the first two verses is in fact an indirect praise of the painting's creator and by implication of the donor of the church. And so the one who has chosen the painter is praised because he has chosen this painter. The painter is indirectly praised for having created an image that is acharandon. As the monks take their place and turn their gaze eastwards to the sanctuary, they see the second intercessory, intercessory composition. It is the theisis, as the Byzantine calls it, the supplication, mm -hmm. which is situated on the east reveal of the arch of the north and south bays, respectively. Right? We, we have here, you, you, you see, this is the Ieron Vima with the Templon, and the thesis is this composition here. Originally, if, if I might add, originally the painter had also painted two exquisite paintings of Christ and the Virgin Mary. They, uh, dated, they are part of the 1192 project program, um, but they were removed from the church and they are now, they are preserved thankfully, uh, at the Archbishop, uh, at Archbishop's Museum of Byzantine Icons in Nicosia, so you can see them there. But I would like you to keep in mind that what we would be seeing in 1200 would be a different type, much more simpler form of a templon with two immense paintings of Christ and the Virgin Mary in front of us. Right? So we have a redoubled version of the vases. Now let us look at this composition more in, in more detail. On the north arch, we find depicted the uh, uh, Virgin Mary. <clears throat> She is the Eleusa, while on the south arch stands Jesus Christ, the Garantor. And you probably, most of you have not heard this epithet. He is Oandifonitis. It's this uh, Byzantine legal term meaning the person who gives guarantee to a petition. That is why he andiphoni, he speaks towards the one who addresses him. So Christ, the Andiphonitis. <coughs> On the Virgin's left, from our perspective, stands Saint John, the forerunner. Uh, he is portrayed on the east end of the North Bay. Therefore, and this is very important from a visual point of view, the image of the Arachiotisa with Leo's intercessory epigram is situated symmetrically opposite from John.
That is, she is on the right of Christ the guarantor. Thus, the deesis, the, the, the deesis is a composition that begins from the faithful's left, continues right and up down to the south wall and ends at the image of the Arachiotisa. The case of such an expanded depiction of the deesis, believe it or not, is unique in all of Byzantine art. There is no single other example in all of Byzantine art of the middle and late Byzantine period that has this kind of uh, form. Usually the thesis is always simple and straightforward frontal. Obviously, this is a particular choice made by the Cypriot Lord and his highly accomplished painter. Let us then observe the three holy figures who are holding inscriptions. The first thing to notice is that each of the three figures holds a different type of written object. John the Forerunner holds tightly in his left hand and at the level of his waist an unfolded roll with the following inscription and this is the first this is on your handout text B A. You know this text also from Handel's Messiah says John, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. These are the words John utters when he sees Christ coming to the river Jordan to be baptized in the first chapter of, of John's Gospel. The forerunner prophesies that Christ as the Lamb of God will be slaughtered in order to redeem mankind from uh, their sins. Now, the intense gaze of John's ascetic figure, and if you look at the photograph, the eyes, the pupils of his eyes, have been placed by the artist completely to the right in relation to his nose, is turned towards Christ the guarantor. In this way, our gaze is also directed towards Christ. This is what we look at. This is what John looks at. So that the words spoken by the prophet immediately identify the figure of Jesus as the Lamb of God. The figure of the Virgin Mary is also turned towards Christ. The mother does not look at her son directly since she has bent her head to the ground. Nevertheless, her head her gaze, like John's, is directed to the right and, specifically, towards Christ's feet. From here, down here. <coughs> Which is, of course, a sign of respect towards her son and God. Mary holds in her right and covered hand at the level of her shoulder, so up high, an unfolded document while her left hand rests on her chest. The specific posture of the hands and her covered right hand reflect the manner in which a subject submits petitions to the Byzantine emperor, and this is described formally in the Byzantine manuals on court ceremony. Uh, and we find that both in the 10th and in the 14th century. The inscription now, and that is your text B, B, is a four verse, 12 syllable poem. And let me read it to you. W would you like to hear the Greek while you look at, at the English? So the poem runs like this. Ti meter etis, Την βρωτών σωτηρίαν, παρόργησαν με, συμπάθησον η μου, αλ ουκ επιστρέφουσιν, και σώσον χάριν, έξωσιν λίτρον, ευχαριστώσι λόγε. So, two things are remarkable. On the one hand, the poem has the form of a dialogue since Christ first addresses the Virgin and she answers. 
The dialogue is divided between the first and the second part of each verse. On the other hand, and you can't see this very well uh, in this photograph, but a little bit. Um, on the other hand, the dialogic form is visually emphasized through the use of a different color for each interlocutor. Red for Christ, I mean, if, if you look carefully, this is a different color than this. Here, here you can see it better. The parori sanme is lighter in color than the dark black of the other part of the text. This division of color is a painterly convention for highlighting the importance of the text. And let me just give you one example. Um, we find it in luxury manuscripts of the same age, of the Comnenian period here, a very nice Luke Gospel from the Benaiki Museum in Athens, 12th century. In the poem now, Christ the Garantor asks the mercy-giving Mother of God what her request is, and she mentions the salvation of mortals. Christ, despite his initial objection and for the sake of his mother, guarantees that mankind will receive salvation. The guarantee given by Christ is the result of the Virgin's intercession in her capacity as mediator of mankind to the King of Heavens. Beyond the use of these two voices, the dialogic poem is based on dialogic passages from the intercessory hymns of the orthodox liturgical uh, poetry, which were read in monasteries after supper during the time of nocturnal prayer. Therefore, the two voices of the intercessory epigram were constantly present for the monks when they were in the church looking towards the sanctuary. We should also note that the visual impression of the poem with its two colors further emphasizes the characters of the dialogue. In the first part of the first verse, we find the salutation mother, while in the second part of the last verse, we find the salutation word, that is Christ, the word, logos. The faithful, once they have finished reading the inscribed poem, turn their gaze towards the addressee Christ, the guarantor, whose reassuring voice they have just heard. Christ holds an open book in his left hand and at the level of his elbow. The text of the inscription, spreading on both pages, reads as follows, and this is your passage B, C. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The text of the inscription, like that of John the Forerunner, comes from the Gospel of John in the 8th chapter, where in one of his teachings Christ talks to the gathered crown in, uh, crowd in the sanctuary of the Temple of Solomon. The specific saying, Ego imito fos tu cosmo, is often used as the words of Christ in the open book he is holding because he directly refers to a verse of the prophet Isaiah. It's from uh, Isaiah's ninth chapter, and you know this, I will read it to you, you know this passage because it also appears in Handel's Messiah. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, and they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death Upon them hath the light shined. It is with this light that Christ's, I, Christ identifies himself in the Gospel. As guarantor, he confirms his promise to the Virgin Mary and interprets Isaiah's light as the light of life, that is, of the new life in Christ. The book that Jesus is holding in the Theisis is now, and that is very interesting, it is the only open book in the entire painterly decoration of the church. High on the church's dome and above the faithful, Christ the Almighty holds a closed book, while the book that symbolizes him in the allegorical depiction of the etimasia, 
directly below <coughs> the, his depiction as the Almighty is also closed. In both depictions, the books have no voice. Christ, and that is very interesting, speaks only in La Gudera when he is in the present time of the third structural and hierarchic level. That is, when he, as son of God, is standing among the faithful. But while Christ has just conversed with the suppliant Virgin Mary on his left, and he is now addressing all the faithful in front of him, his serious gaze is turned to the right. Take a look at his eyes. They are completely right-oriented. This gaze is directed towards his triumphant mother, the Arachiotisa. For the monks and for the rest of the faithful, Christ guarantees with his gaze the salvation of Leo and of his family, as expressed by the Cypriot Lord in the prayer surrounding the Arachiotisa. However, because the generalized phrasing in the second part of the supplicatory poem includes all those present in the church, Christ guarantees the salvation of all. In this way, the artist has united the two intercessory compositions in the present time of the divine liturgy, and by using word, sound, and image, he has conveyed to the faithful the certainty that mankind will be saved. In this manner, the correct reception of this extensive supplicatory composition by the congregation finds its completion. To a great extent, this correct reception is based on the presence of the inscriptions which the holy persons are holding in their hands. Recalling the five functions of the inscribed discourse, we realize that each of the three inscriptions performs a different function. Prophetic, for the inscription of John the Forerunner, Behold the Lamb of God. Intercessory, for the mercy-giving Mother of God. And admonitory, for Christ the Guarantor. Such is the consistency with which the artist expressed the didactic and consolatory purpose of the impressive vases. As then, the liturgy comes to an end, the monks exit from the door from which they entered, while Lord Leo, with his family, exit from the south entrance. They pass from two other crosses flanking its interior, also decorated with one verse inscriptions. Thus, the visual decoration of the church did contribute decisively to the conviction of the faithful that in the world to come they will receive salvation of their souls. In fact, the presence and various functions of the inscriptions as animated images did play a very important role in shaping this conviction. And this is a major achievement of Byzantine Christian art as manifested in the Cypriot Church of the Panagia Arachiotisa at La Gudera and its exquisite frescoes. Thank you very much for your time.